This story is about a band of Confederate cavalrymen during the Civil War known as the 43rd Battalion Virginia Cavalry, or Mosby's Rangers. This unit conducted military combat guerrilla operations into Northern Virginia behind enemy lines, especially Fairfax County, and became recognized by the United States Army and the Marine Corps as the most feared and successful guerrilla unit in the history of modern warfare. The commander of this partisan unit was a man by the name of John Singleton Mosby, who would obtain the rank of colonel and would become one of the most notorious and romantic figures that came out of the entire Civil War. He was one of Jeb Stuart's men, and it was due to the confidence that General Stuart had in him that he was able to organize and lead this famous band of rangers. This little body of a few hundred men under his skillful and daring leadership accomplished more with less by hitting quickly, gobbling up horses, men, and supplies, and disappearing into the mist before reinforcements or help could arrive. These men yielded more trouble for the Union Army than a brigade or division could produce and kept large numbers of Union troops guarding the Washington City instead of fighting against Robert E. Lee in the field. Entire brigades were sent after him, and a price was placed on his head. But he was always able to give his pursuers the slip. Mosby was never caught, and the bounty was never paid. Behind me is the junction of the Alexandria, Loudoun, and Hampshire Railroad with Hunter's Mill Road, a strategic point. All during the war, Union and Confederate troops moved up and down these the roads. Of particular interest to us is General J.E.B. Stewart's Christmas Raid of 1862. Stewart came up the railroad from Vienna and crossed here on December 29, 1862, headed for Herndon. Following General Lee's approval, Stuart had assembled 1,800 cavalry and four artillery pieces for a raid into Northern Virginia. On Christmas Day, 1862, General Stuart crossed the Rappahannock River at Kelly's Ford on what would become known as the Christmas Raid. John Mosby had served with distinction as a scout during Stuart's ride around McClellan's Army during June of 1862. He was now serving as one of Stuart's experienced and trusted scouts on this raid. The raiders proceeded to capture Quantico, Dumfries, and Aquaquan, gaining some 170 federal prisoners and numerous supply wagons. Arriving at Burke Station, Sturt captured the telegraph office and listened to federal messages concerning where he was and what he was doing in Northern Virginia. Here he sent a message to the War Department in the city of Washington complaining of the poor condition of the mules he had captured and was using to pull the captured wagons. Moving toward Fairfax Courthouse, he encountered a heavy Union force with artillery and not wishing an engagement, bypassed there and took the road into Vienna. Winter weather had made the roads muddy and hard to travel. In Vienna, he found the excellent gravel roadbed of the Alexandra, Loudoun, and Hampshire Railroad running north. This offered the opportunity to quickly move his artillery and captured wagons towards Herndon. From Hunter's Mill Road on December 29, 1862, Captain Mosby accompanied Jeb Stewart here to the house of Miss Laura Ratcliffe on Centerville Road, one and a half miles south of Frying Pan Church. Major John Scott, who wrote a history of the Partisan Battalion in his book, Partisan Life with Colonel John S. Mosby, related a conversation that occurred before Stewart left. Stewart called in company with several of us to make a visit to Miss Laura Ratcliffe, who resided near Frying Pan Church in Fairfax County. As our party rose to bid this lady farewell, I was surprised and pleased to hear the general address her in the following language. You are such good Southern people through this section, I think you deserve some protection. So I shall leave Captain Mosby with a few men to take care of you. I want you all to do what you can for him. He is a great favorite of mine and a brave soldier. And if my judgment does not err, we shall soon hear something surprising from him. 
It wasn't until the next day, however, on December 30th, that Stewart actually left Mosby with a few men to take care of the good Southern people through this section, as Stewart had promised Laura. Stewart and Mosby had traveled west from Laura's house into Loudoun County and were staying at Colonel Hamilton Rogers' house called Oakham. Oakham is located on today's Route 50, just east of Middleburg. As Stewart and his men left on the 30th, he left Mosby with nine men. Thus, Mosby began his life as a partisan ranger and returned many times to visit, protect, and to gather intelligence from Laura throughout the last two and a half years of the war. She would repay him by saving his life. In early 1863, the commander of Union Cavalry in the Fairfax area was Colonel Sir Percy Wyndham. He had been exceedingly annoyed by Mosby's activities against his pickets and had actually sent a letter to Mosby calling him nothing more than a horse thief. This, of course, did not go over well with Mosby. On the evening of March 8, 1863, Mosby and 29 men left Dover, just east of Middleburg, Virginia, en route to Fairfax Courthouse. It was Mosby's plan to teach Wyndham a lesson. On the night of March 8, 1863, Mosby and 29 men left from Dover near Middleburg, Virginia to capture Wyndham. Before departing, Mosby had said to a friend, I shall mount the stars tonight or sink lower than plummet ever sounded. With able assistance from a former 5th New York Cavalry Sergeant, James Big Yankee Ames, who had recently joined Mosby and his men, the Raiders slipped into Fairfax Courthouse without any major problems. Upon their arrival there, the men went to work seizing horses and taking prisoners. Mosby soon found out that Wyndham was not there, having left for Washington, but he almost simultaneously discovered that Brigadier General Edward Stoughton was in town. With a few hand-picked men, Mosby forced his way into the gunnel house where Stoughton was staying. The general had spent the night at a party and was not easily awakened. Mosby settled the matter by lifting up the general's bed sheets and his nightshirt and smacking him on the bare buttocks with his gauntlets. The following discussion soon took place. General, did you ever hear of Mosby? Yes, have you caught him? No, I am Mosby and he has caught you. All that was left for Mosby to do was to gather his men and his prisoners and make a hasty withdrawal before the sun rose. He did. When the operation was completed, Mosby and his 29 men had captured a brigadier general, two captains, 30 other prisoners, and 58 horses. The mission was accomplished while they were virtually surrounded by thousands of enemy troops who were but minutes away from being able to wipe them out. In accomplishing this extraordinary mission, Mosby and his men had not fired a single shot. We're standing on the Bowman property on the south side of Air Hill near Vienna, Virginia. The camp of the 2nd Massachusetts Cavalry was at the top of the hill. It was here that a young man named William Ormsby, better known as Pony Ormsby, was shot for desertion. Pony had ridden away from his command on the 24th of January, 1864, was caught riding with Mosby's men on February 5th, brought back to camp and tried on February 6th, and executed on the morning of February 7th. It was here that Ormsby was executed and buried by his own men. For more than a century, the exact location of Pony Ormsby's gravesite was unknown. He seemed to be destined to follow the fate of a great many Union and Confederate soldiers who had simply disappeared into oblivion. But it was later found he was found hiding in plain sight in Arlington National Cemetery. Apparently, just before the 2nd Massachusetts Cavalry returned to Boston to be mustered out, they marked the site of Pony Ormsby's grave. Later, government contractors hired to collect the scattered bodies from grave sites, hospital sites, and battlefields all over the state and collect them in Arlington National Cemetery found and dug up Mr. Ormsby in Vienna and removed his body to Arlington where it lies to this day. This is the ruins of the barn that belonged to Carolyn Machen. 
and this was a landmark of a fight that occurred on the 24th of June of 1864 between John Singleton Mosby's men and the 16th New York Cavalry. And the significance of what occurred here was that Mosby's men captured Boston Corbett, the man credited with killing John Wilkes Booth. Let me tell you that story. On 24 June 1864, about sunrise, Walter Whaley reported that a patrol of 40 men from the 16th New York Cavalry were in Centerville. Company A found the New Yorkers had departed, riding towards Chantilly on the Little River Turnpike. Company A learned that soon after they left Centerville, companies B, C, and D had arrived and followed the road the Union troopers had taken to Chantilly. About a mile and a half from Centerville, they overtook the enemy. The Federal commander, Lieutenant Matthew Tuck, had allowed his men to rest at the farm of Widow Machen so they could feed their horses. When the partisans arrived, a number of the Federals had climbed some cherry trees, enjoying the fruit. The Rangers immediately charged, killing and wounding six and capturing 31 men and 38 horses. The Southerners did not lose a man. One of the Federals captured in this fight was Thomas P. Boston Corbett. Corbett was captured by Bushrod Underwood. Here is that story. When it appeared the fighting was over, Underwood returned and with several prisoners reported to William Chapman, who was in command at that fight. Captain said Bush, there is one fellow over there that gave us some trouble. He is sheltered by a persimmons tree and a small ditch, and he has a seven-shooter repeating rifle. Captain Chapman listened to his report and directed Underwood to return and get that fellow. A body of 20 men swept towards that persimmons tree. The first man to dismount was Underwood. Underwood alighted at the feet of the Union soldier, and with a quick movement he knocked the Spencer rifle to the ground. At the same instant he drew his revolver and pointed it at the head of the disarmed prisoner. He would have blown the man's brains out had not Captain Chapman said in a stern voice, Don't shoot that man. He has a right to defend himself to the last. Underwood obeyed and lowered his weapon. The prisoner was sent to Richmond and would later be exchanged and become a man identified as killing John Wilkes Booth, Lincoln's assassin. We're standing here on the edge of Flint Hill Cemetery, uh, Oakton, Virginia. The address is Vienna sometimes. Uh, I'm standing behind the Oakton Church of the Brethren that has the third building on this site during the Civil War. As far as I know, there was an outpost here made of perpendicular logs put together, and it was a dispatch heaven for people riding with dispatches from Vienna to Fairfax. We're about two and a half miles from Vienna, about two and a half miles from Fairfax. There was no chain bridge road in those days. There was a courthouse road that goes down by the other side of the church from here. The, the end, as, a, as the guys came home from the war and went back to their normal pursuits, there were three Mosby men who ended up in this cemetery. They uh, did what they had to do and, and con conducted themselves nicely. And then in the end, they were buried, as most men are, in the ground. And these were happened to be at Flint Hill Cemetery. So we're happy to have those people with us in this cemetery. Located on the very doorstep of the city of Washington, Fairfax County was a witness to combat operations throughout the entire Civil War. Colonel Mosby and his small but daring command were imminently successful in their hit and run ambushes which intimidated, embarrassed, and kept close to 40,000 Union troops guarding their capital. Fairfax was one of a handful of counties that would become known as Mosby's Confederacy, where Mosby's legend reigned supreme and Mosby himself ruled the night.